All right, everyone, welcome to the Max and Vernon Project. Super excited today. We have two awesome professionals here with us. And by the way, a big round of applause for them to come on because anytime you have a disagreement or a debate or a discussion, it's not always the most enjoyable to try and hash it out online, but also least enjoyable even in person sometimes because it's tough. Um, you got to talk about it. Um, and social media, unfortunately, doesn't allow for so many characters that long form does. And these two have been awesome in communication. So I give you my biggest bit of respect and big thank you and applause for that. Um, just on a personal note, regardless of anyone listening to this, the opinions that you might have on the conversations about to take place, just recognize that these two had a pair of brass balls to show up here. And I, I respect <laughs> the hell out of that. Thank you, guys. And Vernon, by the way, introduce him. I didn't even say who it was. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, for those listening, watching, uh, hopefully we can get this up on video as well. We got a uh, Keir Wenham Flat, uh, the rugby guy, as those may know, and Joel Seedman, Doctor Joel Seedman with a D, as he wanted to make sure that I, 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 I made sure I slid that in there. Uh, but for those that are listening, uh, you know, I think this is kind of cool. Max kind of touched on it. We touched on this on our last podcast there, maybe two ago about you know, debating on social media and how things can get so lost in translation and not really understanding the context of the standpoint someone stands on. So, I mean, the brass balls that come up here and to say what you're saying, I think is productive uh, for our profession, quite honestly. So, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Max talked about, we're gonna talk about that red pill. Uh, yeah. that broke, it broke the internet. So, so uh, here we for go. For those Max. of you who aren't fully aware, Joel, Dr. Joel Seedman had, can I just call you Joel? Do you mind if I say that? Yeah, totally. I'm so used nope. to Instagram handles. I'm stuck with at rugby strength coach. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, only, the only people I make me, uh, you know, call me by Dr. Joel are my immediate family and friends, everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Joel made a post about warming up. And as he had mentioned in the caption, it was going to break the internet. And yes, the Nostradamus was correct. He predicted that one to the nth degree. Um, and it caused quite an interesting discussion. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of summarize it, but I'll let Joel take it away and kind of give the whole idea. But it was the uh, essentially the breaking down of how maybe we don't need a warm up like we think we need to, as long as your body's functioning properly. Um, you provide some demonstrations in that and some examples of how it doesn't just pertain to sprinting, but also a follow up with the lifting itself. And Joel, I'll let you explain that all because you probably do a better job of explaining that than I do. And for those of you curious, the original post and article as well are out there. All right. No, I mean, you kind of nailed it on the head. I mean, essentially what I'm, I was trying to get across and I was taking a, a pretty extreme scenario of, hey, like as humans, we should be able to sprint um, and do things of a pretty high exertion levels, pretty high intensity physical activity without the need to do these excessive warmups. And in fact, if somebody's body mechanics are solid and they have good you know, muscle firing and good muscle function that if they had to, if they got into a predicament or a scenario where they had to sprint or they're running for the life or they had to chase someone or you, know, you never know what life throws at you. Um, you know, it's, it's not always a scenario where we get to warm up and where we get to foam roll for five minutes, do some corrective exercises, mobility drills, and you know, gradually ramp up our, our sprints until it's like, hey, now I'm ready start chasing after me now it, we don't always have that luxury in sports obviously we do but in real life scenarios um oftentimes we don't so i think one thing that people um probably misinterpreted a little bit because i, I showed you know demonstrations of the no warm-up protocols was that i'm suggesting that you eliminate warm-ups and and you know there's no need to warm up and I, i'm totally not suggesting that in fact i think a good warm-up is important and it's very beneficial improves neuromuscular efficiency it improves muscle firing and it, it definitely enhances performance. There's no doubt about it. My thing was, it's like, Hey, if you don't have the luxury to do that, can you still do it? Because in reality, most high functioning humans should have the capability to do that. If their bodies are firing right or functioning right. Awesome. Thank you. And Kier, assuming you have a rebuttal or a discussion point to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't doubt that you, that you did the experiment for an entire month. And I don't doubt that you've got through it healthy, but I think it's when you're dealing with limited number of individuals, small data sets, stuff like that, you're, you're not going to see the trend. So if you, if you look at um, most of the meta analyses that are out there, most figures are going to put somewhere between like 0 0.25 and about 0 
hamstring tears per thousand hours of athlete exposure. So if you, if you take those numbers and you say, okay, three to five sprints a day, call it 20 minutes, from probably shorter based on why I read your article, 20 minutes a day, basically you would not expect a hamstring injury based on, on that math. So let's say 10 hours of exposure over one month, you would expect right. 0 0.02 hamstring tests. Right. And if you take you and the three colleagues that you mentioned, you do what you did every single day for a year, it gets to 486 hours of exposure. Based on the math and the research that is available, you still wouldn't expect a hamstring tear. So yeah. I, I don't doubt that it's possible to do that. Right. The question is when you, when you get to a large enough data set, you are going to see hamstring tears. Oh, yeah. And then it's a question of, well, what, what do you need to do to mitigate the risk against it? And the kind of, uh, well, I did it. And, right. um, you know, I, I got through it unscathed is the kind right. of like, my grandmother smokes two packs a day and she's 90 argument of like yeah. strength and conditioning. There's the, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street used to do five grams of cocaine at night. Yeah, yeah. His book no. is not a health book. Right. So well, I think your points, are, I think those are all awesome points. And keep in mind, um, that, that's one of the reasons why I discussed this is to show like, look, we don't need to be afraid as humans to do these, these type of movements in technically, you know, non-warm states. It's like showing, hey, it's, it's totally possible. And it's not like I'm a, a rare anomaly. I'm suggesting that actually, as you said, it's like, we, we should expect, most people should be able to do this. It shouldn't have been like, oh man, you do this experiment, you're gonna pull something. Because one of the reasons I wanted to do this article too, I was just looking back um, several months ago at some of the things I did on, you know, I, I wrote a lot for T Nation and, and for bodybuilding.com um, up until a few years ago and my, my schedule just got kind of crazy, so I couldn't do that. But I would remember when I posted this um, little tidbit, like a few paragraph, um, section in an article about this about you know humans should be able to sprint without um, injuries and we shouldn't expect injuries to happen so many strength coaches so many trainers and, and you know so many lifters were like oh no way if i sprinted cold right now i guarantee you i'd pull a hamstring it's like why like that didn't make sense to me like you said it should be like the the chance for pulling a hamstring should be so small that even if you took a normal person and had them go through this, it's like, yeah, the, the, the chances of it occurring, the possibility of it occurring should be almost infinitesimal. But for some reason in people's minds, it's not. It's like, why is that? And, and oftentimes the thing gets back to your nervous system telling your mind like, hey, I can't do this because I am going to injure myself, maybe because muscle function is off. So I think, again, it just gets back to the point, if muscle function is sound, I think you probably would agree. It's like, yeah, you can do it. A lot of athletes should be able to do it it's not something you, I would recommend to do on a consistent basis because it probably would not be optimal. It's not optimal, but we should be able to do. I think what your points you just made, it's, it's, it's basically verifying that additionally. You know, I think it's like, you, you can talk about what should be, for example, right. we should be able to eliminate teen pregnancy if we just tell them to say, unfortunately, we don't operate in theory, we operate right. in reality. Right. And if you, you're not going to find any system in reality that never has any any risk or anything that blows up. So if you think about race cars, mechanical systems like race cars, airplanes, far more consistent than any biological system, and they still blow up. And you still see in race car driving, warm the tires up, do the diagnostics, build the speed up. When you take off on a plane, they test the flaps, they test the engines, they do all this kind of stuff. You take a biological system like a human being and say, well, in theory, we should be fine. Right. Well, that's great, but stress, sleep, uh, illness, just little variations day to day are going to increase the risk and make it uh, a fact. A fact. Uh, it doesn't matter what what in theory is. Your, right. your our job, both of us, our job is to operate in reality. Oh yeah. And the risk is you say okay. The risk is however small small risks still have big consequences and it's basically free money you can take a certain number of steps to mitigate that so for example you say oh in theory we should be able to drive around without wearing seat belts because the risk of getting into a fatal car crash is just so tiny yes it is tiny but you can just take a little intervention and reduce the risk of harm yeah yeah no, I, again i'm not arguing with that at all i think those are those are great points and and i think uh this is why i was you know, when, when everyone was like, oh, why are you suggesting like you don't warm up or this is stupid that you're telling people to do? I, I'm not doing that. I'm simply, all I was trying to, it was highlight in this article, literally all, all I was trying to highlight 
was the importance of good body mechanics for athletes and for humans. That's literally all it came down to. I wasn't trying to suggest that, hey, you know, everybody go do this test. In fact, I had people reach out to me and like, oh man, Dr. Steven, this is awesome. I'm going to go do the sprint test right now. I'm like, oh, don't, don't do that. Like, please go read the article. And, and you know, like, I, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just, you know, and, and when they, and then I had a few people write back, be like, oh yeah, no, I read it. I see what you're saying. I'm not going to do it, but it makes sense what you were trying to say. So I was just trying to use a, you know, kind of an extreme scenario and a, a highly suboptimal condition um, to show what's possible, um, you know, when we don't, when we don't have the luxury of being able to do things that we want. And I had, as, you know, one of the things I didn't even think about this for the article, but a lot of people posted on the comments, a lot of um, military people, a lot of police officers, a lot of martial arts uh, individuals, and they were all kind of saying like, yeah, this actually makes sense because, you know, we have to be trained that, you know, if we have to go run after someone, like we have to be able to do this. So like I said, I don't think it's something that people need to practice. It's like, hey, save that scenario for when you absolutely need it. But if, again, if body mechanics are sound, our, our chance and our, our possibility here for injury is going to be significantly less. So it, basically improve your body mechanics and make it as bulletproof as, as possible. It's not going to be 100% guaranteed, but the better our body mechanics, I think everyone would agree with that, the less chance of injury, whether that's under warmed or non warm conditions. So I, I think one of the questions that came up then when we were going through stuff um, was what is optimal body mechanics, right? And what is the cause of injury, right? Because we're kind of bouncing around the idea, the initial um, statement you had was like, oh, this we don't need to get hurt. And yeah, I mean, this, you, you ran and didn't get hurt. But I think people are like, well, you, you could get hurt maybe potentially. Yeah. Um, and the question that comes out of that is, well, what causes an injury and why is warming up maybe not necessarily the end all be all for the cause of the injury itself? I'm assuming that's kind of what your post was pointing towards yeah. was like, look, the injury plays can happen, but it's not necessarily the warm up fault. It is the body mechanics part. And right. if you could elaborate on that, maybe that would help kind of uh, sift out some of the questions. Yeah, no, definitely. I think. I mean, you know, this is always a, a tricky topic, basically um, defining what proper muscle function is. This has been a this has been a, a topic of debate for years now in the fitness industry, and it's one that, to be honest, I don't think we're ever going to come to a unanimous decision where everyone's on the same page and like, yes, this is proper muscle function as it says in this book, as defined by. That's not going to happen because honestly, every strength coach has their own definition of muscle function, whether they realize it or not, because their training methods and protocols that they use for their athletes are based on that. And every strength coach uses a different method unless they happen to be copying the exact version of, you know, whether it's Jim Wendler or, you know, uh, Mark Bell or whoever they decide to copy, but most people don't do that. They have in their mind, here's what's optimal because in their mind, they have kind of this underlying definition of what proper muscle function is. So Again, if, I, if I'm just thinking about muscle function, I'm thinking, hey, things are in line. You know, you don't have maybe when you're running, you don't have like, a, a, you know, some people's hips or their knees may swing out um, or they don't get good dorsiflexion. They don't get good extension with their hips um, or maybe they overstride or maybe they go past, you know, significantly past 90 degrees with their hips. I've seen this a lot with some of the athletes. Um, I've seen this with, with the ones that tend to spend more time stretching their hamstrings are usually the ones that get the most hamstring pulls and injuries. And I, I believe, and I, again, I don't think we can prove this right now, at least that, um, at least that, but I've seen that those athletes are more susceptible to hamstring pulls because they end up uh, taking too big of strides and overstretching their hamstrings when they're running. And so one of the things I've noticed over the years, when we, when we kind of eliminate those stretching protocols or hamstrings and teach them how to fire their hamstrings, strengthen their hamstrings, strengthen their posterior chain, eliminate the stretching, then it's like, okay, we improve their muscle function, so to speak, and they don't get those hamstring pulls anymore. So it's a, it's a tricky topic, but I think you can say, hey, alignment is a big one. How the muscle's firing is a big one. You know, is there a, like, a, I like to call it neuromuscular hiccups. You're, you meant to perform a certain movement and, and your mind wanted to, but your nervous system didn't carry it out properly. Like a lot of these non-contact injuries we see, sometimes these guys, no contact, all, all of a sudden they have like a valgus collapse their knee, blow an ACL out like whoa how did that happen that was that was a fluke that was a neuromuscular hiccup a pretty bad one at that and they they lost control of their muscles in time they, they lost control of um, you know they're firing they didn't have proper motor control and that led to to an injury and again we can discuss it but I think large things like a valgus collapse extreme external rotation 
extreme, you know, trap and, and shoulder elevation right. protraction when we're running. I think those are kind of the more simple and general things I, I would say a lot of professionals would agree on as far as getting more subtle, that's probably more personal. Awesome. And Kira, if, would you want to kind of dive into that with the same concept of, is the warm up necessary? Um, and if so, or if not, what other factors involved in the injury process? You touched upon it a little bit earlier, but if you could elaborate in detail on that. I mean, all injuries are fundamentally a question of time. So when the demands placed in the tissue exceed the capacity of the tissue to resist those demands, you're going to get a failure of that tissue and you're going to get an injury. So the, the biggest way to manipulate that is the input, i.e. the demands that you're placing on that tissue. So muscle function, uh, joint sequencing, motor control, it tells you the cost of doing business. But if you give someone a sufficiently big load, you're going to break it. So you can have vertical landing mechanics. If I drop you off a building from two stories, you're going to break. So the, the, the biggest factor you see in hamstring injuries is higher top speed, which is why men are 106% more likely to get hamstring impaired than women, even though they may be mechanically very, very similar. That's why kids don't tear hamstrings in the playground as well, because they don't have that raw output. You also see the higher the percentage of your maximum speed that you operate at, the more likely it is you're going to be placing sufficient demand on that tissue for that tissue to fail. So I think it's 80% of hamstring tears occur during sprinting, long head of biceps. So if we go back to the sprint experiment, I think Joel, you reported in the article, you said top speed, I think it was eight to 18, 19 miles an hour. Okay, so if we convert that to meters per second, it's about eight and a half meters per second. So I took the video, like, can I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let me see if I can get this up. Says you need to let me, Max. I, I do not have <laughs> any idea how to. Uh, <laughs> Give me a second. Hang on, people. And if you don't mind, if you can hold your mic up a hair. Yeah. When you're talking, uh, you're kind of coming in and out. Okay. Um, can you hear me I now? can mute you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Sorry. Well, I'll I'll just talk you through it, right? Yeah, just talk through it. I don't know how. If unless it's you share and I can admit it, it doesn't give me the power to let you share directly, unless you ask to share. Sorry, it's it's in the the file that I emailed to you. Okay. Well, I can I'll, do it. I'll just hold my phone up to the screen here. Okay. So basically, download the video. If, if you look at the video, so your facility is about 50 yards. Away. So let's say you're going to be hitting the highest speed that you're going to hit kind of midway through because the rest of the time you're going to be holding that speed. You're going to be decelerating. So if you download the video, it's 59.2, include decimal frames per second. So what I've done is, and I'll, I'll share this with you. You want the, the picture here? Uh, there's two sheets to it. So there's 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 a kinogram and then there's a, a, a top speed motion capture. And if you email so, that to me, Vernon, I could put it on too. If you email that Vernon yeah, to me. Yeah, so I, I already emailed that to you. So, oh, you did? Oh, yeah, basically, if, if you take that top speed, i.e. upright as fast as you're moving, kind of like midway by the camera, you, you've hit three yards in 0 0.4 seconds, which is 24 frames. Works out to about six and a half meters per second. So that's 75% of your self-reported top speed, which is, it's not sprint. It's not a sprint experiment. So that would, that would be for the field sport athletes if we're going to like tempo pace, which it should not be unsurprising that you can sustain that all day. Um, it's not going to be risky because you're not getting into the kinds of speeds that you would expect a hamstring tear to occur at. Um, you also mentioned in the experiment, um, you know, heart rate up to 180, uh, walk back recoveries, if you look at the heart rate that you're hitting, it's more indicative of the conditioning workout rather than the speed workout. If you look at the rest periods that you're using, we know that you're not gonna be able to hit the necessary outputs that stimulate speed or would be associated with a hamstring tear if you're using insufficient or incomplete uh, work rest distribution. Did the same for the, the, the NFL guy that you, um, that you mentioned. So if you go to the second page, uh, Max, Nice. So um, NFL receiver, four yards, about 0.48 seconds. That's about seven and a half meters per second. And if we just, I don't know this top speed, but let's just say NFL receiver should be able to comfortably hit 10 meters per second um, for a top speed. Again, it's, it's, it's tempo speed. 
So it, it's unsurprising that you can do that healthily. Um, it's not going to, it's certainly not going to stimulate speed and it's probably not going to be that risky in terms of um, a hamstring injury. So it's an experiment, but to me, it's, it's not a sprint experiment. And that's the reason why you don't see elite level track and field athletes sprinting every day and just walking back between reps because the, you know, all athletes are lazy. If they could train in 15 minutes and get the same results, they would. And you know, if you look at elite athletes are going to do what is necessary to make the most amount of progress possible. If they could sprint every day, they would, and they don't. Right. No, I remember I said, I took the most suboptimal conditions to try to show what's possible and what is, what can happen. I didn't say, Hey, this is optimal conditions. And I even said in the article, um, I believe, and I didn't, I didn't time any of this. I didn't record any of the, you know, I didn't get a laser out and say, Hey, I want to see how fast I was going. I said, I hit my, I believe I hit 80 to 90% of my top speed, which now I guess looking at it, it was less than that. Um, but you know, you got to keep in mind, as I said, totally cold conditions. Okay. And it's around 50 degrees in this facility in the winter. So it's, it's not optimal, but again, I'm not trying to show like, Oh man, I'm so fast. Or it's like, Hey, at max exertion. Okay. Under cold conditions, you know, if somebody was chasing after me, or if I had to chase something, or if I had to go, like there was an emergency. You know, oh, oh, you're back. We, uh -huh. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. We, you stopped that emergency. Yeah. Emergency. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, shoot. That was planned. That was planned. <laughs> no, but um, no, all I was saying is that, yeah, you know, it's, I, I don't. I'm losing him upon. Is, is Joel using AOL dial up? Like, what is yeah, going on? <laughs> Joel, we got you back. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on here. No worries. No worries at all. So, yeah, no, like I said, um, basically, I, I, I'm not saying like, oh, we should be able to sprint at top speeds under uh, non-warm conditions. Are you guys still there? I want to make sure you're here. Everybody yeah. here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm saying that, hey, we should be able to sprint to our fastest ability at that time, whatever that is, you know, whether it's 70, 75, 80%. I don't know what that is. Like I said, I didn't report it, but I know I was personally going at my maximal ability and, and most people should be able to do it. And I know, you know, obviously I'm not a high level athlete by any stretch of the imagination compared to the um, average fitness person or even the average human, my sprint speed is probably a little faster just because most people aren't even fit. So, you know, all I'm saying is like, hey, here's what the human body should be capable of. I'm not suggesting that high level athletes do this. And yeah, it was pretty slow, but it was the best I could do. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, injure myself. And like you said, I would did a 30 day experiment on this, but this is something I've been doing on and off for like nine years, literally, because I, I was at the point when I was 24, 25, I couldn't sprint anymore. I could barely deadlift and squat anymore because my body, the thing that changed for me essentially was I improved my body mechanics. That's, that's what's changed for me. It's not like, oh, you know, I've always had this and it, it's not, I lost this ability for about three or four years. And I, I think most human beings should have it if they keep their muscle function uh, optimal. And obviously the faster the person, you know, yeah, the, the greater the risk. This is why, again, I'm not suggesting high level athletes do this, especially on a consistent basis. But again, I'm just saying it should be possible. Okay. So uh, going off that, I think a lot of the things we see on social media is not really understanding the context behind which someone's saying that, or maybe where they're coming from. So just the kind of, I guess, a question I'd like to hear you, um, and then Akir, if you want to jump in, is you know, you, we keep, you keep saying like uh, optimal body mechanics and training for optimal body mechanics. So would you mind explaining what, how do you train these optimal, these optimal body mechanics, maybe personally with what you did or what you do with athletes that you see can elicit this ability to um, sprint cold um, as you're saying? Yeah. Um, the first time you guys still see We, we got you. We yeah. got you back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, no, I think um, so. I mean, this, you know, we can definitely get into some of the training protocols that I do. Um, I'm a big believer in the, you know, 90 degree centric isometrics. And I know people, some, some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, it's what I've been using for about eight, nine years now. And um, basically the eccentric isometric protocol, it's a, it's a form of tempo training. It's a form of pause training, which is nothing new. It's been around for decades. And basically it's a, it's a controlled eccentric 
okay, followed by a strong pause with toe contraction in the roughly 90 degree position. So it's, it's nothing too earth shattering in that regards. Um, I'm not a believer in using excessive uh, range of motion or what I, what I would consider excessive range of motion or exaggerated range of motion or even large range of motion. I, I'm a believer in, hey, let's try to simulate optimal or, or functional body mechanics that we are likely to see on the playing field um, in positions that we you know, want, to, want to see more frequently and in positions that we want to occur as much as possible on the playing field. A lot of those occur at, at around 90 degrees. We don't see um, too many movements uh, where we exceed these you know, 90 degree positions or at least significantly exceed those and have these extreme range of motions. Um, but even if we do, I, I believe that if our muscles are healthy and we're, we're um, producing good muscle function and good firing patterns, that even if we get into these suboptimal conditions and biomechanically disadvantageous positions and extreme range of motion, that our muscles will be able to absorb the force at that point in time um, if everything's firing correctly. So, um, you know, the, the 90 degree eccentric isometric protocol, I've seen it be very beneficial, not just from my own personal training, but for all the athletes and, the, you know, literally it's, um, you know, not just hundreds, but I'm talking thousands of people I've worked with, which I realize it's a lot of N equals one scenarios. So it's not like a research study where it's like, hey, we took 50 participants, here was the control, here was the eccentric isometric, I, you know, that would be, that'd be lovely if, if we could do a, an eight week study on that. It, it'd be um, tricky to do where you carry out the protocols in an optimal state and where everybody is coached and cued uh, the way you want them to be. But anyways, that's kind of my training in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you. And, and uh, Kira, if you have any opinions differing on how that influences the potential body mechanics of sprinting in that regard, and whether or not your opinion of um, how we train body mechanics, is it, is it universal? Or is it sprinting specific? Um, and, and kind of, you know, piggybacking off that response there. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you talk about what is, what is optimal sprinting mechanics, opt, optimal is what helps you run the fastest. You know, you, you make your living as a coach by making athletes as fast as possible. Um, the idea that optimal mechanics are going to be those which maximally reduce the risk of injury. It's just not the case because the best way to reduce injury is to have the mechanics of sitting on the couch. You know, you're never going to hurt yourself if you sit on the couch. Certainly there is, there's a cost to benefit, but typically what you see is that the, the mechanics that lead to efficient sprinting and that keep athletes healthy are mostly one and the same. There's going to be bandwidths that elite performers tend to operate in success leaves clues. So, Dan Paths put it up as a picture of the, the, fur, the, the you know the, the fastest eight guys at the Olympics starting. And it's like eight guys basically doing the same thing with differences between them that are just like too small for the human eye to see. So if you go to page one of what I sent you, okay? If you don't mind sharing this. Yeah, pull it up. So I, I took a kinogram of uh, a Joel at top speed and I compared that to, um, you know, top speed of... Uh, an elite master sprinter that's hitting 11.4 meters per second. Okay, so this is uh, toe off. This is moving right to left. Toe off, maximal vertical pro projection, knees together, uh, knee under hip, and then toe off again. So these would generally be like the key landmarks throughout the gait cycle that you can look and compare between performers. So if you look at the, the first one on the far right, you, you look at that hip extension, that's gonna lengthen the ground contact time so whenever you're looking at sprinting, you're looking at how do you maximize propulsive relative to braking force? And what you see is when athletes really push out the back like Joel's done like that, yes, you do get a little bit more time to apply propulsive force, but relative to the additional braking force that you expose yourself to, uh, it's just not, the juice is not worth the squeeze. So you actually run slower by doing that. Then if you watch, you can't see it as much in the kindergarten, but if you watch the video, you get this big like looping heel action in the residual phase. So between the first and the second, what you'll see with Joel is, if you can see the guy above, his, his shin is horizontal, which means he's shortening the lever of his swing leg so he can reposition quicker and get down to apply more force to the floor. With Joel, you've got this big, long lever like that. So his, uh, his recovery during swing phase is gonna be slower, reduce stride frequency, doesn't run as fast. You also see when this heel comes up, you set yourself up by not being able to get into as high of a blocking position with the thigh. Uh, so that would be the, the second from the left. 
the higher you can get that thigh during blocking, the more time and distance you give yourself to unfurl the shin and attack it down into the floor and create pretension. Because at those high speeds, it isn't necessarily the force that you produce during ground contact uh, that's going to make you run fast. It's how much tension you can create prior to ground contact, deform the tendon, return the energy, and then get off the floor again. Because it's all about how do you maximize that force in the time that you have available. Okay, one of the one of the ways that you increase uh, breaking force and breaking impulse is you get into more of a squat position during stance phase. Okay, that lengthens ground contact time, and again, it slows you down relative to how much force that you're producing. So if you look at the extension in the top guy's leg uh, during ground contact relative to Joel, Joel's more squatted down. His his contact times are going to be longer. Look at the, the the contribution of the arms. So generally. Your arms are going to go down into the floor to increase the vertical ground reaction force, which obviously is going to push you up and down the track or down wherever you're running. And you actually see um, during the end of the stance phase that the elbows start to pop up and contribute to that vertical force, that vertical impulse. So if you see the guy in the top, you can see he's got a bend in the backside of his arm and it's actually popping up and contributing uh, a little bit to the force that the ground is pushing up with. With Joel, you've got an arm straight back and down it's a long lever to match the long lever on the other side with his opposite leg. And then if you look lastly at the, uh, um, the, uh, the blocking on the, the, the front leg, again, in the leftmost post, he's setting himself up uh, to have a poor ground contact in the next step. And this is like the, the vicious cycle of sprinting is errors in one stride will set you up for errors in the next stride. So the idea that optimal muscle function lends itself to optimal mechanics we're not seeing that transfer here so if eccentric isometrics is the optimal way to train for optimal muscle function and this is going to help us sprint faster and stay healthier to me that's not the case right now okay because you you can respectfully this is this is not a personal attack but objectively you can send this to any top level sprint coach and they'll point out what i just pointed out and more as to what are suboptimal mechanics Heel striking, for example, if you if you look at the video by step two, heel striking and bolt upright. This is, this is not optimal for sprinting. It's validated in the research and it actually is associated with a higher risk of injury and less optimal function. So if you are healthy doing this, I would say it's more as a result of running slowly and not understanding what sprinting is as opposed to optimal mechanics. Respectfully. Now, I, keep in mind, I never said my sprint form was was incredible. I mean, I'm not a trained uh, sprint athlete. I mean, I basically, uh, I just, you know, sprint to the best of my ability. And the article is not meant to be about sprint form. In fact, um, you know, if I got, you know, sprint training or, or had a, a track coach uh, give me guidance on that, I'm sure it'd be better. But I wasn't, that was not the point of the article. If anything, you know, it should highlight that the re- So, um Hang on with us. We're dealing with people in different places. So, Joel, okay. we lost you at reason. Sorry about that. Okay, are, are we back? We got yeah. you back. Okay, cool. No, it's just, you know, I think we're you're looking at, like, my sprinting mechanics is like, oh, well, this, like, negates everything. It doesn't. I'm talking about all of my athletes that I train. I'm talking about the hundreds and literally thousands of people that I've helped to reduce injury, which is why I get pro athletes coming back to me. It's because, hey, guess what? They just experienced a season where they didn't have injuries. They, they feel better after a few sessions because we do the eccentric isometric protocol. Um, they can tell a difference right away. Athletes, you know, to try to like brainwash them into thinking, Hey, this protocol is going to be uh, optimal when they're, when they've never done it before, they're going to have to experience it for themselves and they're going to have to see the difference. And the only reason why I keep getting athletes coming back to me and have clients coming back for years on end after they had injuries they couldn't deal with is because the training protocols um, so, you know, you could talk, I mean, this is, again, you're, you're kind of, this is a, this argument of like, oh, well, Joel didn't do it right. Well, it's like, I'm not, I'm using me as like one example of hundreds of scenarios that I've seen and just trying to show that, hey, optimal body mechanics are important as we would agree on. And here's what I believe that the training should look like, you know, what I do with my athletes based on, you know, it's just how I like to train my athletes because it's what I've seen has been optimal and ideal and produce the least amount of in okay where did you what was the last thing you heard you said injuries but you're talking about basically how you're 
body function is not a representation essentially of the training protocol, as opposed to the athlete's body function who come back to you. Yeah, no, I don't think my sprinting form is, but I think a lot of things I do in life have improved immensely over the years because I wasn't able to sprint before. So, you know, we're taking a scenario. It's like, Oh, I don't have optimal sprinting form. Well, we don't know what it looked like before. I don't, I don't have videos of it before, but I wasn't able to do it when I was in my early and mid twenties without injury. So something's obviously changed and my speed has actually stayed the same because I remember uh, when I measured it when I was doing undergrad, it was about the same, about 18, 19 miles per hour. So I'm, I'm the same as I was, you know, 14 years ago in terms of speed, we're so, we're so close. Form. I want to talk more about. Uh, we're losing you again. We're back now. We got it's like bits and pieces. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. No worries. Jeez, um, I'm gonna have to figure out something. Okay, can I just I, reply real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that there's a couple of self-contradictory statements in there. So I mean, if you if you if you read the article, I'm quoting yeah. the article here. Um, let me have a look. Uh, Uh, I've had track coaches tell me quite recently, actually, that I have incredible running mechanics. Not the case, respectfully, not the case. You said, I'm the same speed now as I was in undergrad. Presumably, since undergrad, you've decided eccentric isometrics, this is, this is how you're going to train your athletes. You've seen the results. You've done it for eight or nine years with no change in top speed. So I'll, I'll take your statement that, you know, eccentric isometrics is the way to train for optimal mechanics. So there? Yeah, sorry. E eccentric isometrics is the way to train for optimal mechanics. I'll, I'll take you at your word, but clear, I mean, there, there is clearly, if that has been the major change since undergrad to now, there's, it's, it's clearly not transferring to sprint mechanics or sprint speed, which is essentially what we're paid for. I'll, I, I, I accept your athletes like how they train, they feel better. Certainly when you train with uh, long time under tension, it inherently reduces the load that you can use and athletes that have just been getting beaten up all year are going to feel better when you put less load in their back um but you know it the, the explicit statement is made in the article the secret to staying healthy is optimal muscle function and optimal mechanics so the the argument that you've yeah, it's I, insinuated in the article i did the sprint experiment which is not a sprint experiment and i stayed healthy specifically because of my optimal mechanics which aren't respectful well, I think we'll have to disagree on that to an extent. I, I see what you're saying. My sprint mechanics aren't great, but I think, um, you know, a lot of people writing in saying like, hey, they couldn't do that because they pull something. I, I'm talking about too for like, you know, the average person reading this is not going to be a, a you know, a track athlete or a superstar athlete. We're talking about, hey, just for the general population, a body mechanics are improved, even if it doesn't you know, master their sprinting form, it'll be a lot better than had they not improved their body mechanics, you know? Um, so that's, that's, I mean, I think you're kind of overeating into this and you're so focused on my sprinting mechanics, you're missing like, you're missing the big picture here. Um, so I think, you know, um, I, I, I mean, I don't know why you're so isolated and so focused on just my, like, just me. I mean, I, I would say, look at athletes I've trained, look at you know, all the clients that I've worked with. And, and that's what I'm talking about. It, it's not, it's not you specifically. What I'm saying is right. the reality of what you're doing and the arguments that you make in the article don't tally up with one another. And, you know, as I said, the secret to staying healthy, if you don't want to tear a hamstring is run slow. So running slow and running your hardest are not mutually exclusive. It can feel hard. You can tell yourself that you're running really fast. If you, if you don't hit those outputs, you're not going to hurt yourself. He you said, yes. Okay. The, the way or improving mechanics is important to minimize the mechanical cost of doing business and to ensure that you're in the correct positions to produce muscular force. What's the easiest way to do that? Iron out all of those issues before they run fast. Also known as a warm up. If, if you say that the purpose of this article is to demonstrate to people that they can improve mechanics, the easiest way to do that is a warm-up because N equals one, eccentric isometrics is not doing the job. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I just, I would have to respectfully disagree. Again, if you're looking at just at my, you know, sprinting mechanics, then um, 
and, and you know, as, as like a, a, an efficient track athlete. Okay. Yeah. But I, again, I, um, that I'm doing that is like, Hey man, you're going to, you're going to blow something out the way you're sprinting. It's like, okay, I'm just doing the best I can given that I'm not a track athlete and given just that, you know, I try and stay healthy and I believe what's, what's keeping me healthy and what is keeping me healthier than what I've ever been in the past is the training. And this is what I've seen from my athletes. So I do believe eccentric isometrics and uh, using the 90 degree joint angle oh, yeah. is what's helping. It's what's doing the job. And I had, a, I had an athlete come back yesterday from uh, the Falcons. Um, he said that, you know, every year, every year that he's pulled his hamstring and pulled his hip flexor. We trained just a little bit this year before the season. He said it's the first year that he hasn't pulled his hamstring and hip flexor. Um, you know, and obviously there's multiple factors that go into that, but I would argue that the training has, has had a, a decent impact on that. So, you know, um, I don't know what to tell you. I, I've, I've just seen, I've replicated this over and over again for the last word for it. If you want to, no one's forcing you to say, oh, you have to believe this or you have to train with my methods. I'm just telling you what I've done and what's worked. Gotcha. So I guess one of the questions would be off of that, um, there's a couple of questions for each person. And if you don't mind me asking them, I think that'd be easy. We can kind of go through the back and forth of that. If you don't mind. Sure. Okay, cool. I can't see you, Joel. So I have no idea. <laughs> I think you're here with us. Um, uh, you I, guys can hear me? I can, yeah, we can hear you. Hear fine. Perfect. Yes. Yep. Um, I, I guess the question would be, what do you think the eccentric isometrics are doing and, to help with body function? Cause I'm not familiar. I've read some of your posts. Uh, I read the article, right? Um, I, I, I have co-contractions are some of the things I've heard brought up, but yeah. treat me like I've never heard it before. So I, I don't have any, you know, misunderstandings, I guess, from the short text I've read and what benefits yeah. that could be providing that then carry over to sprinting. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's, it's basically reinforcing sound and strong 90 degree angles, which is something that we want to see a lot of in running mechanics on the field for different types of activities and sports. Um, when we start seeing mechanics that start breaching those 90 degree positions, I think we, this is where I mentioned earlier, we start setting ourselves up for maybe hamstring pulls or, or muscle tears. Uh, also, it ingrains sound alignment. You know, if we're talking about, you know, like we mentioned earlier, internal rotation, internal rotation, those are things, generally speaking, when somebody is doing linear sprinting that we don't want. But unfortunately, a lot of athletes do demonstrate that when they're when they're doing sprinting and when they're running. Um, that's one thing I, I can pretty much assure you I don't have too much going on and that's probably something that saved my hips because I have had pretty bad hips in the past but um you know when we see athletes swinging their hips and having these swinging gait mechanics when they're running you know it's setting themselves up for groin injuries for hip issues um the eccentric isometrics help to basically reinforce sound body alignment kind of these neutral positions and uh when athletes do them they tend to carry over into their sports, into their running, into whatever sport it is that they're playing. And their body mechanics are basically more enhanced. They're able to stick and adhere to these sound positions much easier. It's something they don't have to think about. They're, uh, the scenario of them getting into a uh, biomechanically compromised position is a lot less. It, it happens much less frequently. And it's for that reason, they probably experience less injuries. Gotcha. Okay, and then um, Kieran, let's have a question towards that. I have a, we have a question for you too, if you don't mind. You want to Wait, you, you want me to reply, or you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to follow up with that one before, if you have something to say, we'll let you do that. And then I have a question for you. That yeah. then, I mean, you know, look, look at look at the knee angles during top speed sprinting, which is where the uh, the vast majority of hamstring tears occur. It typically occurs, occurs during terminal swimming. So if you go to that sheet that I sent you, it's going to be the middle frame. It's like five degrees of, of uh, knee flexion. So it's, it's not a 90 degree angle. And you know, if, if we're gonna cite research, we know from the research that you're probably gonna have about a 15 degree carryover from isometrics. Um, range of motion or, or joint angles is one of the criteria for specificity, as is contact time and movement velocity. So you got a guy there that's operating 11.4 meters per second. Some of the fastest exercises you're gonna see in a gym period would be something like on a power snatch you're going to be lucky to hit a peak velocity of three meters per second um the contact time available during top speed sprinting and elite sprinters is uh 80 um uh sorry yeah 80 milliseconds or about you know 80 to uh, 100 milliseconds 
and we know from force plate research that the the distinguishing characteristic between elite and sub elite if we use the two spring model is half of that so it's 40 to 50 milliseconds is the time that you have available to impart the majority of the force that is going to make you run fast and it's during that window you know just prior to ground contact plus that so we say okay less than a tenth of a second to produce force that is going to keep you healthy and resisting the deformation of, of the hamstring and the, and the hamstring tendon um it, it just doesn't pass the smell test if we look at the entire body of research and specificity and say oh this is going to transfer to top speed sprinting isn't it all right then. i'll let give joel joel if you want to have a response to that if not that's totally fine i can't see your face so we don't <laughs> I don't know if you're if you're actually responding to that or not. I'm assuming maybe. Um, and if so, go ahead. And if not, we have a question for Kira then to follow that up. Yeah, yeah. I, I just guys keep in mind one thing. I uh, I apologize for the the connection here. I do have clients on the hour. I had an 11 to 12 gap here. We can go about maybe another seven minutes. Um, and I, I can't get too far behind here. But uh, yeah, no. I mean, I I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I. I can tell you, I've done a lot of research on this. I mean, it's beyond the scope of what we can talk about in, the, in, a, in a little podcast, but um, I've seen it work. So it's, it's, you know, until you've tried it, I, I've tried traditional training. I've tried traditional astograph squats. I've tried all the, you know, kind of uh, methods that we currently see in the fitness industry. And I've adopted my methods to something a little bit different out of necessity because I found that it worked better. And this is what I've been using with my athletes. And I found that, uh, there are superior results. So, you know, until you've tried my methods, it's a little tough to say, Oh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, sound right. It's like, well, maybe, you know, I'd recommend maybe trying it and seeing, and if you don't like it, you know, nobody's pointing a gun to your head saying you have to do this, or, you know, I'm not forcing anyone to do it. I just simply basically provide the information that I've used, provide the research that I've done, explain why it's worked and why I believe it works. And, and this is why thousands of people are doing it. And I, and, you know, um, I don't, this is, I, I hate, toot my own horn because it's, it's uh, not something I like to do, but men's health reached out to me a few months ago. They want to do a story on my training. They literally wanted to, to kind of contact me and say, Hey, Joel, we want to actually do an article on you and your training methods, because we're seeing not only your athletes that you work with do it, we're seeing thousands of people around the world use these methods. Now the methods that you've been advocating with great success, we at men's health had recently started using them. And guess what? We're finding benefits. For men's health to reach out to me and want to do a story on this, okay, when they usually they only do stories on celebrities or athletes, unless it's just a basic, you know, oh, you know, bicep, tricep article. But for them to do a story, it's because they vetted the process. They went through thousands of basically people who are doing this, probably tens to hundreds of thousands of people doing this, getting results, having less injuries, producing, you know, more functional strength and hypertrophy. And, and, you know, not having the, the problems with their joints and inflammation they once had. And again, um, they did that because it works. So I don't really know what else to say um, unless you try it. Okay. So, uh, Kier, uh, uh, thank you for that response, Joel. Kier, so you're saying that the uh, eccentric isometric protocol might not be the, you know, the best in your opinion. Uh, what would you be your ideal training ideology or in an ideal situation that you would think would express these notions of better mechanics or optimizing mechanics or whatnot? What would be your ideal, all things considered, um, no different than Joel said for that? And not like a long, you know, what's your whole nine month training cycle, but something yeah. like, okay, I don't agree with the, maybe the, the eccentric isometrics. What areas does it not cover that you would and cover as and why i guess that'd be the question if that's fair vernon in yeah. in what endeavor in any for sprint, field for sprint, for sprint. no no i'm saying i'm, I'm saying oh. this a rhetorical question you know okay. in, in what endeavor in any field anywhere do you get better at a thing by practicing that thing less and doing something that looks nothing like that thing it doesn't happen okay the the the, the, the way that you master optimal sprinting mechanics is by practicing sprinting again and again and again in a purposeful manner and then intelligent uh, coaches will uh, place environmental constraints or manipulate the the nature of the task or provide feedback to adjust how athletes sprint to get into more optimal states 
what people would call like attractor worlds, attractor states, fluctuate states. Um, the idea that you're gonna uh, dramatically enhance motor skill in a given task by doing something that looks nothing like that task, if it works, it's indicative of a low level of training. And again, respectfully, you know, men's health is, is not a bastion of scientific research. Uh, numbers of people uh, doesn't strengthen an argument. There are, you know, 10,000 people in Washington DC a few weeks ago that think that Hillary Clinton eats babies. You know, this is strength in numbers. If, if you look at the elite, elite level in field sports as well, they get there by practicing the actions again and again and again and understanding most of them. Gotcha. Well, I'm not, yeah, I would argue I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I think the best way to get better at sprinting is sprinting, but I'm saying along the way, the training that I would also incorporate would be, you know, the eccentric isometrics. Gotcha. So I, I know you're short on time here, Joel. So I just want to take a minute to wrap this up and first off say thank you again to both of you. I know yeah, we've guys. Uh, really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day. I know internet connection wasn't the most enjoyable, but we, yeah, we, we powered through it. No worries, Joel. Uh, next time, we'll, if, if we do have a next time, we'll make sure we have, you know, all the fun internet stuff figured out ahead of time. So I, <laughs> I appreciate it. And no worries at all. It happens. I totally get it. Um, again, big thank you to both of you. And if people in the future want to come on here and talk to anyone, debate, discuss, we're happy to host and moderate this because we learn a lot from it. Burr and I are selfish. It's, yep. it's something we get to hear both sides. Really awesome to hear uh, Kieran and Joel um, kind of dive into the weeds of what they looked at, what they thought. It's very interesting to actually hear both opinions and I learned quite a bit. So thank you to both of you for that. I appreciate it. Yep. Pleasure. Thank, thank you guys. Definitely Thanks, appreciate, guys. It. I appreciate it. And as always, thank you for listening to the Max and Vernon project. As always, we call it a project because it's hard to call this a podcast. <laughs> I don't know what we do here, but we, we stand in front of microphones and sometimes let other people talk and sometimes we talk. So appreciate you guys listening. We hope to have this up as soon as we can. And Vernon, get ready to edit our first <laughs> edited podcast uh, ever. <laughs> hey, bro, don't, don't send me the unedited. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. Thanks, Joel, so much. I really appreciate thank it, man. Guys, appreciate it. Hey, thank thank you. I can't see your face, but I'll give you a thumbs up, and I'm assuming, uh, you know, take That's care. Enjoy. Thanks, guys. All, All right. right. Thanks, Bye.